Hello, friends, uh, colleagues, and postgraduate students. Uh, welcome to the fourth seminar uh, in our series. This is the Humanities Religious Studies Research Collective. My name is Milad Milani, and today's speaker is Sarah Bacala. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country um, and their connections to land, sea, and community. I myself am on Darug land, and I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples present today. Um, Sarah Bacala is a writer, researcher, and audiobook producer. Sarah has recently been a co-investigator in a University of Divinity-funded research titled Openings for Collaborative Theology through Classical, and I may not pronounce this correctly, Yonu and Walpiri epistemologies, and is uh, also co-editing a 2023 special issue of the Journal of Inter Intercultural Studies on Relational Epistemologies in Australian Indigenous Thought and Performance. Sarah is also on the editing collective of the Journal of Continental Philosophy and has had work published by Logos, which is the Journal of the World Publishing Community, The Conversation, uh, Z Feed, uh, Sydney Review of Books. And for a list of her publications, you can of course go to um, the Religious Studies Collective website um, um, and you can uh, see more on, on her publications. Sarah co-directs Voices of Today, an Australian independent publisher and audiobook production company. Sarah has a BA in uh, uh, theology, is it Bachelor of Theology or um, Bachelor of Theology, Graduate Certificate Research Methods and Graduate Certificate in Divinity. She is currently undertaking her PhD at Western Sydney University and exploring concepts of God and self in Hegel, which sounds really fascinating. Um, Sarah is also obviously a member of the Religious Studies Collective and has kindly been assisting me with the facilitation and organization of the seminar series to date. Today, Sarah will be talking about contingency, necessity, compassion. Hegel meets the New York Times bestsellers. She will be explaining uh, for us, the belief that, quote, everything happens for a reason, end quote, is uh, pervasive in contemporary nonfiction books on the New York uh, Times bestseller list, uh, particularly in those written from a Christian quasi-theological perspective. By engaging he Hegel's lectures on the proofs of the existence of God, uh, a rarely studied text, she will explore how the elimination of the notion of con contingency in, in um, deference to divine necessity can reinforce individualistic capitalist narratives about personal responsibility, agency, and power, distracting from critique of belief systems and social structures that perpetuate inequality. She will ask whether and how, when coupled with assertions of divine sanction, such beliefs impede positive social change. I personally am looking very much forward to learning more from Sarah about this fascinating topic. Sarah, over to you. Welcome and thank you for being here today. Great. Thanks, Milad. And uh, thank you for your kind introduction. It really just makes me feel uh, insanely busy and uh, bad at saying no to things. <laughs> I accumulate a whole lot of uh, interesting projects, but I don't know. That's kind of how I like it. So here's my thesis background. My research explores concepts of God and selfhood in uh, uh, in relation to the work of Hegel, with a particular focus on the ways in which God has been interpreted um, in Hegel's writings, the theological context in which Hegel's philosophy and its interpretations has arisen, and the resources that Hegel's ideas about God might have for Christian narratives and theology today, or the critique uh, that some things in Hegel uh, can offer. Now, I've done a very good job somehow in my thesis of beating around the bush and sort of like exploring how everyone else talks about Hegel instead of just, he's quite a formidable uh, uh, prospect. So, <laughs> but nonetheless, I think I'm there now. I can't avoid him any longer. Um, uh, 
as I guess with most doctoral theses, mine looks very different from what I imagined it would at the beginning, um, but that reflects the exploration and learning process that a research project is. And, you know, if we knew the answers at the beginning, there would be no need to actually go on the journey. So the probably final chapter of my thesis shifts gears from the previous nine chapters. When asking about Hegel's ideas on God, I needed a way of establishing whether the contexts in which we find ourselves uh, here and now are a relevant and meaningful place for some of Hegel's ideas um, to be aired afresh and why that might be. In English speaking academia, um, talk about God can be a bit embarrassing as though at the mention of God, we automatically conjure images of the old man in the sky with the long white beard or of militant crusaders um, as though there are no alternative ways of conceptualizing ideas about God or asking wider, more meaningful questions about the theological imagination beyond sort of ontological realist Christian rhetoric or medieval superstition. But I wanna show in my thesis that the question of God and God's implications for human subjectivity and experience are still dynamically live within large populations and communities throughout the world and that this shouldn't be belittled or conveniently ignored. While the number of people who identify as Christians is declining in countries such as Australia, as the latest national census shows, um, on other continents, particularly in Africa, Asia and South America, Christian communities are growing. 67% of the world's Christians reside in um, the global south nowadays, which equ equates to almost 1.7 billion Christians. Um, and perhaps surprisingly, the number of people worldwide who follow any religion is um, is said or was said in 2020 to be at about 88.7%, which is actually an increase from the 1970s when the figure was estimated to be 80.7%. This suggests that questions of God and certainly of ultimate reality and the meaning and purpose of human life are very live and real today. Theological beliefs are part of the daily lived experience of large communities of people, particularly people living in vulnerable conditions. Theological ideas still create and reinforce the interpretive frameworks by which people understand themselves, their world and their role in the world. We cannot afford to ignore this fact uh, if we're interested in ethics and human flourishing, um, even if we might sometimes feel intellectually above certain things or feel uncomfortable about engaging with ideas that are entwined with um, undoubtedly horrendous historical damage when politics and power and religion have been entwined. In fact, that probably makes it more important to be able to talk about these things. More to the point, people I know and care about shape their lives around theological beliefs as I did and still do. But back to my thesis. The question for me is, was, how can I find traction between what I and others have found enriching in Hegel's ideas about God and the self um, and areas of theological discourse or Christian narratives today? I sort of wanted to move beyond academia as such because the majority of, of Christians are not engaged, uh, at least really directly, with Western academia. Um, I could, uh, I could have turned to the doctrines, uh, dogmas, belief statements of various Christian denominations and leading bodies uh, and of the historical um, creeds and that sort of thing. Um, and I will obviously use some of those sources as part of the background to my, my narrative. But in my experience, the everyday people who populate churches aren't necessarily familiar with the historical Christian creeds um, or the founding documents and circumstances, even of their own um, Christian traditions. Um, you sort of got to go to theological college to, to learn about that sort of thing. Um, instead, what they do encounter and absorb are the teachings of their pastors and preachers in sermons every week. Um, they're involved in practices that are carried out in their community gatherings. There's the content of songs that are sung week in, week out, very regularly. Um, and of course, there's a spin off media that comes from Christian leaders in forums, such as in podcasts and YouTube, uh, popular books and Christian resources. Even if scripture is another major source of belief for Christians, it's the Christian milieu uh, that they're in that will inform their biblical hermeneutics and how they approach scripture, what they understand its purpose to be and how to engage it. Um, many leaders of mega churches have influencer esque status with professional branding, polished videography of their preaching and teaching videos, and massive followings, um, both 
face to face and in online contexts. And it's that sort of influence and public platform that publishers, including Christian publishers, are looking for when they engage with writers. Because an author platform means that there are people lined up interested in buying your book, uh, buying any book by their Christian influencer of choice. So in this conversation, I turned to the New York Times bestseller list to find out both what Christian leaders are saying today um, and how um, influential authors who may not necessarily be in a position of Christian leadership nevertheless incorporate um, distinctly theological ideas into their writing. Um, as, and this is, this is my textual evidence for the popular Christian narratives that are, may be currently shaping people's um, lives and beliefs. So <clears throat> the New York Times um, has been publishing its influential list of best-selling US published books every week since 1931. Uh, it's, it's kind of very well regarded. And in particular, I've been investigating through thematic literary analysis, the advice, how-to and miscellaneous category in the non-fiction section of the list, because the list is now made up of various um, sections. What theological themes, what ideas about God and the self are present in these English language best-selling titles? Does Hegel have anything to say in this context? Does my version of Hegel have anything to say in this context? I've wanted to explore whether and how the emerging theological themes and ideas in popular books correlate or intersect with the philosophical and theological ideas about God, truth, selfhood, community and knowledge that Hegel was both exploring and responding to throughout his own career. Now, there are plenty of limitations to my methodology. Um, first, just because a title lands on the New York Times bestseller list doesn't necessarily mean that its uh, bestseller status is statistically verified. The precise formulas that go into the, to, um, putting the bestseller list together are secretive and it is editorially curated, even if the results do still undoubtedly rely on widespread sales data. Um, so there's a, a bit of both uh, statistics and curation going on there. Regardless, these are the books receiving heavy publicity and gaining widespread visibility in the US and in other countries importing US cultural media. Um, and this leads though to another limitation, which is obviously that the New York Times is a US-based chart and the flavor of political polarization between right and left is particularly strong in the US. Um, probably compared to other English speaking places around the globe, like Australia and New Zealand and um, Great Britain. I'm not particularly excited about a US centric worldview uh, that skates over the experiences and outlooks of non US global citizens or non English speaking citizens for that matter. Um, and that's recognizing too that, that the US itself is incredibly um, diverse in terms of peoples and experiences. Um, however, as English is my native language, uh, that provides me with some methodological limitations for now. And the media associated with the authors of the books in focus is often available on global platforms such as YouTube. And a lot of, in my experience, a lot of Christian literature in Australia at least is imported from the US and into other English speaking countries. So I guess I'm using the titles on the New York Times bestseller list as a case study. That's really only the very beginning of research into the current themes within contemporary Christian narratives that swirl around the globe in various forms of media and that are concentrated in circles that can be as small as the family and as wide as global uh, denominational, mo uh, denominational movements. Um, so yes, the, the US centrism of the New York Times list is certainly a limitation here uh, and the research should sort of be read within that context. What this exploration does show is what some influential, influential people are saying about concepts of God and the self in an influential um, way. So um, it's really weird for me to just talk at people for this long. <laughs> I sort of feel like I should pause for any questions or clarifications now, but that might disrupt our, our, our uh, pre-planned methodology. So I'm going to keep going. This is your chance for a breather. I'm gonna <laughs> take a breath, keep going. All right, so, but uh, actually, I should say, feel free to write questions in the chat now if you think of them, and then we can come back to them later in the second section. Is that all right, Milad, if we do it that way? Yeah, good. So at least you feel like you're interacting with what I'm saying as we go. Um, all right. So um, I'll tell you about how I went about gathering my info. Um, then I'll explain what I found, 
by engaging in thematic analysis, which I hasten to add is a process that is neither entirely subjective nor entirely objective, uh, but is a sort of personal dialectical engagement with social, social structures and language and ideas that are found outside myself as an individual uh, in the realm of sort of human community, but are, are part of my experience as well. And so it's therefore a relational yet simultaneously critical process. After explaining my data gathering and findings, I'll explore how the themes I've noticed uh, correlate with my work on Hegel and where Hegel might have something useful to inject into contemporary English language narratives of Christian faith and individual selfhood, as expressed in these best-selling American titles, or where Hegel can offer cogent ethical critique of such narratives. In my list of books to analyse, I included titles from the above-mentioned category uh, from 2019, 2020, uh, 2021, and up to September 2022. I included titles that were ex explicitly Christian in outlook, or written by a known Christian leader or public figure. And I also included titles that pertained to self-evaluation and self-growth, where the author demonstrated some definite affirmations of the Christian worldview, uh, whether by apologetic citation of Christian scripture, um, by reference to key Christian theological concepts, such as um, salvation, atonement, sin, uh, by reference to persons of the Trinity, God the Father, Christ the Son, or the Holy Spirit, or by reference to God's will, where God was clearly intended to refer to the Christian notion of God or some clear derivative of this. Um, and there are also publishers that that are explicitly um, Christian in purpose. So they were included, um, books from them were included too. I ended up with a list of 39 titles uh, from the 292 books in the category over that time period. And so far I've read and analysed 23 of these. So just over half. And I'm going to share with you... Um, a list of the uh, the titles. This is my my list, um, the titles, the authors, the publishers, the number of weeks on the New York Times list, uh, whether or not I've read it and analysed it yet. Um, so it's just to give you a sense of, I don't know, the vibe, I guess, the vibe of the titles, the vibe of the sort of, um, sort of things, you know, fierce, free and full of fire, dream big, relationship goals, the good fight, didn't see that coming, a rhythm of prayer, crazy faith, um, undistracted, mission possible, find your people, mothers and daughters of the Bible speak, um, and so on. Um, so uh, I read these titles. Um, I noted general themes as I went along. Uh, and the backdrop, the backdrop of my thesis work on Hegel created a context for a, a context of meaning for my thematic analysis. So Here's a list of the elements that I began to notice and codify in the books that I analysed. I noticed, um, oh, I noted when there was a demonstration of metaphysical realism by reference to a literal being named Satan or the devil. So the number of authors who, who referred to Satan or the devil as a literal um, existent personal figure. Um, whether the author was a proponent of the theory of substitutionary atonement in other words, whether they believed uh, that Christ died as a substitute for fallen human beings to atone for their sins, whether the author appeared to be a proponent of theological um, determinism uh, or theological voluntarism, meaning that they um, demonstrated a belief that things happen in the world or things are the way they are because uh, God has determined them to be so or God wills them to be so. Um, whether there was a recognition that the author's own perspective was one perspective among many perspectives, whether the author sought to speak on behalf of God, that is assert God says or God does this or that without recognising their own perspective as an interpretive force in such assertions. Um, and I call this the adoption of the God's eye view, which is a term explored by um, my supervisor, Diego Bubio, particularly in his book, God and the Self in Hegel, which obviously um, finds its source in Hegel's work itself. Whether the author demonstrated a low view of humanity, so humanity as terminally fallen or tainted by original sin. I mean, even if this is in the context of um, a possible salvation in Christ, that nevertheless, there's this kind of tainted humanness about us that means that we're always incapable of of attaining some kind of um clear expression of truth or authenticity or whatever so with these themes I scored 
them uh, using a very basic three-point Likert scale. So a one indicated, yes, this theme is present in this book. It's explicitly, um, you know, demonstrated. Zero, no, it's not at all. And 0.5 um, kind of, not only that there are hints of it, but sometimes there's a yes. So sometimes yes, sometimes the author does kind of say, you know, God says this, 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 or, you know, this scripture shows us that, you know, as if it's kind of uninterpreted kind of pure objective truth. But at the other, on the other hand, sometimes maybe they would say, this is only, you know, my perspective and blah, blah, blah. And sometimes there's a bit of a strange clash of, um, or attention. And maybe that's not a problem. Maybe it is, but that's how I sort of um, noted that I'd, I'd noticed that. Um, uh, point, the point five kind of was particularly relevant um, in terms of theological voluntarism uh, and whether the idea of God's plan was held in tension with individual choice. So that was another context, whether or not, you know, God's got a plan and everything happens for a reason. Uh, but at the same time, you can take control of your destiny and make these choices and, and have a better life. So it's sort of a bit of a, a strange and unexplored contradiction there. Um, my findings so far, I'll share my screen again, based on the 23 books that I've analysed so far. Um, you, you can see that 57% of these books are uh, expressed or referred to Satan or the devil as a literal figure. Um, and a literal figure that people should should be on guard against or needed to do things to assuage or that the devil had some part in, you know, um, throwing God's plan off the rails. But, you know, so this idea. And and, and to be honest, that um, that quite surprised me. Um, uh, a clear references to substitutional atonement uh, was 30 percent. Um, but theological determin determinism, especially referring to God's will as all determining. Uh, was 78% of these books. And the other um, stat of note was the God's eye view assumed. So when people kind of took on this, you know, it's it's like, I guess it's the kind of thing you maybe find in newsreaders too, but with not such theological loading, you know, it's like the, the all above, this is how things are and, and there's no sort of um, recognition of perspective, perspectivalism, of perspective of, of, you know, I guess the the complexities of of how we make sense of the world and understand truth and that sort of thing. Um, so these were the themes with Hegel in the backdrop that became really clear to me as I as I read uh, through these books. Now I will note that in my thesis I'll include stats on the different Christian traditions that are represented by the author. So Christianity too, of course, is not just some homogenous blob uh, of people who are all the same or people who think the same. There's obviously a massive diversity of of um, tradition and experience but there are some key things that are, are um kind of resonate between these um between differences at the same time and of course you know protestants and catholics that's one kind of major or protestants catholics and eastern orthodox i should say as well um which you know the latter is sort of less likely to be found on the new york times bestseller list um just because of the context that we're talking about um but that you know that's kind of one of the most obvious differences that i will actually note in my thesis but I haven't talked about here. So now that we can see um, two maybe three key themes that are prominent in these texts I want to draw Hegel into the conversation to help us understand what the implications and presuppositions of these forms of Christian narrative might have including for ethical relationality and understandings of the self. So as I've said two of the um, most strongly uh, present themes according to my analysis were number one the denial or erasure of contingency or chance in human life by reference to the will of God. So theological determinism, a form of which is uh, theological voluntarism, the divine will. I hope I'm using these terms correctly because it's I'm still getting my head around how all these things fit together. Um, and two, the assumption, whether intentional or not, of a God's eye view perspective in the language of the author when teaching on explicitly scriptural or theological themes. Now, I know we don't have to preface everything we say with it's just my opinion that, or the way I see things, you know, we just have to kind of go, well, our listeners know that I'm me, I'm me, individual person, and it's my perspective. I don't have to preface every single thing I say with um, with that sort of, you know, disclaimer. But there is a particular way um, of talking, I think, particularly about Christian scripture or the commands of God or the perspective of God, which is more than just... Um, me inhabiting my own space but also there's an implicit assumption that I understand 
the perspective of God or I can see things from the perspective of God or at least, you know, this is my perspective on the perspective of God. But nevertheless, it's still binding because, you know, this is how God, what God says or whatever. I hope that makes sense. Um, it sort of gets beyond just just the common sense um, realm of, of um, subjectivity. So both these themes have implications for the, how the subject-object relation is conceived and the way in which God is posited or conceptualised or not conceptualised um, uh, and, and kind of affects the way these themes are managed by the authors. So these are not obscure issues in the history of philosophy, um, irrelevant to our 21st century lives, but they clearly hold strong purchase, at least in particular sectors of society in these books of the New York Times list. Um, and I'm going to focus on just one today, which I did uh, mention in the abstract, which is the expression of theological determinism as per the idea that everything happens for a reason. And I've linked that in the abstract with the with the erasure of contingency so that like, you know, um, chance doesn't really exist. Everything's, you know, determined by uh, divine will or, or diabolical interfer interference with divine will. Um, uh, and contingency is a little bit of a tricky word because it means different things in different contexts, including in the context of theological um, voluntarism. So I've kind of stepped back my use of that word a little bit in this context, which it's why it appears a lot in the abstract, but not as much in, in what I'm going to say next. Uh, nevertheless, you can see that the dynamic of that uh, relates to understanding why things happen in our lives. So Hegel's lectures on the proofs of the existence of God are were delivered in Berlin in 1829. It's a nice thin Hegel book. See that? <laughs> that's why I chose it. No, that's not true. I've read the thicker ones too, most of them. But um, it's nice to work with a slightly more bite-sized, manageable uh, Hegel text broken into nice bite-sized pieces, uh, not like the science of logic, which is somewhere else. Um, now, Hegel signed a contract in 1831 to publish a text on does Goddess, Gottes, I should say, uh, Dasein Gottes, get your German right, Sarah, um, the being of God or God's being. Um, and he signed that contract three days before his unexpected death during a cholera e epidemic. So we never got that book. And um, uh, Peter Hodgson, who is the kind of um, the editor and translator of the proofs in English, uh, sort of talks about how the, what's in this um, in this book is sort of what he thinks that would have kind of started to build the manuscript for this book that Hegel never got to write. Um, and it's based on a, on a lecture series that he gave, like I said, in 1829. Uh, he gave the lecture series kind of corresponding with his lectures on logic. So um, these lectures, the lectures on the proofs were sort of like a particular application or expression of uh, what he was sort of looking at it in a more abstract or universal sense in terms of the logic overall. Um, and I have to confess, though, that despite the shortness, the nice shortness of the book, uh, I found the title a little bit off-putting, Lectures on the Proofs of the Existence of God. And I avoided the text for a while because I thought, oh, what? Like, what? <laughs> Hegel's just going to... Anyway, but the lectures on the proofs of the... The proofs of the existence of God, of course, refer to the historical proofs, the ontological, cosmological and teleological proofs uh, that are present um, in, in both Christian and Islamic um, literature in terms of um, understanding or, or uh, using reason to understand why um, why the being of God is necessary. Um, uh, anyway, when I did finally pick up this book, I found it was a treasure trove of pertinent ideas for anyone interested in the themes, theological themes, uh, themes that we're looking at here, um, particularly in Hegel's response to the work of philosophers like Immanuel Kant and Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi, um, who... Uh, yeah, doesn't get talked about quite as much, but is quite interesting as, as a, one of Hegel's foils. Um, now, everything happens for a reason. Um, the will of God, sorry, the will of the God of the beyond and the denial of contingency. So let's uh, get into this theme a little bit more. As we know, suffering uh, often leads us to the question, why? Um, and we know that finding or perhaps creating uh, meaning in the midst of suffering can be redemptive and it's a process of intrinsic discovery and strength you know we all admire those people that have been through um, horrendous things but have somehow found reasons to go on and have used their horrific experiences to benefit the lives of others um, but to assume that bad things happen for good reasons can also be destructive as when a suffering person is told that oh well, you know everything happens for a reason 
steps like you know well did this person die for a good reason am I going through this horrible thing for did you know it's 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 just horrendous really uh to imagine being told that in certain circumstances what reason are we talking about whose reason sometimes the books that I've looked at in the New York Times bestseller list uh sometimes in these books Bad things that happen are attributed to the devil or Satan. Uh, as I've said, who's treated by many authors um, as a literal personal nemesis of God in the spiritual realm. God's victory over Satan is expressed in our own victories over these diabolical events as we tap into, I don't know, God's power, God's um, the spirit of God. Um, the books that I've analysed have consistently presented the idea that God's will and God's higher purpose lies behind the events that shape our lives, including the negative events. and um that everything has an explanation not necessarily in terms of empirical causality like why did this book just fall off my desk um although you know there's no denial that you know that that there are a category of things for which that's true too but for these books when it comes to human experience spirituality and events causality can for some class of events um be traced back either to divine will or di diabolical disruption of divine will um, in an expression of theological determinism in varying shades, whether as divine command theory or other forms of theological voluntarism. Um, always, however, what happens, uh, according to these authors, authors, um, what happens is or can be for our good in the long run, even if we don't see it now. The attitudes expressed by authors don't always eliminate the possibility of free will or human agency, and in fact assert its importance in the context of life's events. After all, these are self-help books. Um, so that theological determinism is often held as compatible with or parallel to free will. Uh, and yes, as I said, this shouldn't surprise us because it's the self-help genre and, uh, and you know, no one wants to read books that tell them, reinforce a sense of powerlessness. So some things are the result of God's will and some things are the results of our choices in these books. And Finding the difference between the two is obviously essential to our happiness and fulfilment, but often there isn't any way given of interpreting how things fit in or which things fit into one or the other category, um, or even any recognition that there is this sort of dualism in play. It's just sort of there as part of the, the fabric of the text. And I think, yeah, that's potentially problematic um, for, for readers, for vulnerable readers, I suppose. Perhaps um, maybe it's just one of those times where where there's that um, serenity prayer, which kind of came originally from uh, theologian Niebuhr, um, where, you know, you ask God for the courage to change what you can, the serenity to accept what you can't change and the wisdom to know the difference. Is that sort of the way that we, you know, we approach uh, these two categories of things, the things we can control and the things that God controls? Um, but in a sense, I see this everything happens for a reason approach. Uh, within a theological framework as attempting to eliminate contingency on a conceptual level. Contingency being the idea that there are things in life that are unpredictable and that seem to happen for no good reason. Um, none of these books quite express a hard theological determinism and eliminate free will altogether, as I've said, but it, it, it's there's a theological determinism to such an extent that readers still feel there is ultimately a divine plan for their lives, that an all-powerful being is at the helm and that everything will be all right in the end. To some extent, expression of this belief is linked to the second theme I noticed emerging emerging in the texts, that of belief in some level of immediate access to divine knowledge. Uh, and that's expressed, as I've said, in what um, Gubbio after Hegel terms the God's eye view. To assert that there is a divine plan may not mean that I know what that divine plan is, but it does still assume a level of familiarity between the human and divine minds the divine mind being conceived as outside and beyond human subjectivity that gives people great confidence or certainty in making these claims. <clears throat> it also means I assume the authority of externally imposing upon someone the fact of such reasons. They may not feel that such good reasons exist, but I do, and this is because of my faith or connection with God. These books then tap into the age-old questions, sorry, these books then tap into the age-old questions about free will and determinism, divine and human agency, reason and revelation, but not usually in any particularly self-aware way. They're not theology or philosophy textbooks, I suppose, after all. Um, they don't, there's no awareness of the way in which uh, there are ethical relational problems inherent in making such assertions, which is why I'm trying to make a point of it uh, 
for whatever reasons that is. Um, the problem here, at least by reference to Hegel's lectures, is not the assertion that there is a reason for everything, but rather the understanding of where that reason comes from and how it emerges. The problem is when reason or reasons are externally imposed on us, on existence, by a presumed God of the beyond, via a presumed agent of that God, rather than through our own personal discovery of purpose or meaning meaning that arises intrinsically from things themselves, from us within ourselves. Um, and I suppose this um, this sort of brings to light a fairly poignant contradiction in that these are, these are self-help books. These are about finding our own sort of internal movement, our internal um, strength to move forward. But, um, yeah, when there's a God of the beyond whose reasons are always beyond ours, there's sort of like a strange... Um, no, it reminds me of a washing machine where the balance is out and, you know, it starts to rock around really, <laughs> really crazily. Um, so real reason, reason for things, reason uh, in life is about intrinsic movement. That's the Hegelian part, what Hegel calls internal necessity, um, which is the process of the logic of becoming. We could talk a lot more about Hegel's logic, but we won't. Before I finish, um, I just want to, and I feel like really my treatment of the theological stuff is fairly scant, but um, I want to say a little bit more about the God's eye view and unmediated access to divine revelation uh, and the dual epistemologies of reason and revelation because it's linked to what we've talked about. Um, in Hegel's time, as in ours, the opposition between faith and reason was an ep epistemological problem. Um, Hegel shows that faith in these lectures, that faith is as rooted in reason as it is in any feeling of certainty. Um, this is why doubt can be so existentially painful and overwhelming. Doubt gets to the cognitive heart of faith. So Hegel wants to reassure his listeners and his readers that, you know, faith, um, faith and reason are not sort of these two polarities or these binaries that, that um, people in his time were sort of saying that they were... Um, Part of the division between faith or revelatory knowledge and reason is the idea that faith has access to a type of knowledge that reason does not. So while we have our human reason, right, where we can't understand why bad things are happening, there's a reason out there. God has reason. Um, and it's the reason of, you know, that we access through faith. It's it's through revelation and sort of divine reason. And that's kind of qualitatively completely different to human reason. Um, which is inherently flawed. And, you know, we could talk about original sin um, in that context too. Um, while, <sighs> yeah, so while reason is mediated by all our human limitations uh, from that perspective, and, and Kant makes this clear in his philosophy on the limits of pure reason, instead the knowledge of faith can be perceived as epistemologically other, vouchsafed to us by divine means. So it's the higher form of reason, the real, you know, God's wisdom. Um, this supposes an unmediated access to divine knowledge through a special spiritual faculty, or according to Jacobi, he, that he sort of said there's a, a spiritual eye um, which, with which we perceive these things, a way of knowing that is somehow deeper and truer than anything our mere human minds in their use of reason can arrive at. Uh, an implication that comes with operating out of these dualities is that we divide knowledge into sacred and secular, divine and human, infinite and finite. By standing on we, what we claim to be divine knowledge, revealed directly to us by God, we claim an ungrounded authority that trumps any human knowing and allows religious authority to be wielded, while sim simultaneously undercutting even our own, um, even our own store of finite knowledge. So, you know, this is just what I think. Blah blah. That's where the sort of subjective stuff fits. Um, but there's a there's a knowledge out there that's you know above and beyond all this, and you know it's this. So. I can assert both mine and that at the same time. So um, sometimes faith or revelatory knowledge is described as knowledge of the heart in contrast to head knowledge. Uh, anyone who's been in church and listened to sermons, I'm sure will have heard that said, especially in charismatic or Pente Pentecostal context, um, or as uh, faith as feelings in contrast to rationality. Um, and, you know, sometimes over history, theological, uh, uh, theologically academics and people, scholarly people have got a bad rap because of that. Um, historically, this was prominent in Christian pietism uh, and contemporarily, it's particularly observable in Pentecostal or char charismatic Christian narratives. 
The danger here is that feeling itself is valorized or that certainty is confused with truth, um, which Hegel talks about a lot, without critically reflecting on the content of any feeling or certainty. So the feeling itself is enough. But as Hegel points out, certainty is different to truth. And a person can feel destructive feelings as strongly and with as much conviction uh, as they can feel constructive ones. If knowledge of the heart or the knowledge of faith is opposed to head knowledge or head thought, you know, thought, this can undermine and curb the human impetus to think critically. And that's sort of what uh, I find particularly concerning. Um, Contexts where critical reflection or intelligent thought is denigrated can be a dangerous or that that can be a dangerous mechanism for manipulation or control in religious group settings. Belief in immediate knowledge has a particular texture of approach to Christian scriptures, um, as I've talked about earlier. So a writer uh, of one of these books that I've looked at doesn't have to be a fundamentalist to assert a belief in scripture as the inerrant or as the divine word of God, absolutely true, as though it's sort of fallen out of heaven, landed in our laps, untainted by human intrusion. And even when we, you know, recite or explore or, or explain things, that still sort of falls under that divine revelatory um, banner. Um, and and sort of there's a real link here between everything happens for a reason, you know, God's reason and, um, yeah, my ability to take on a God's eye view. Um, it's this attitude uh, in these books that's often connected with the adoption of a God's eye view approach to life, the idea that I myself can see things from God's perspective even if I don't realise that I'm assuming this. And I don't think it's necessary. I don't think, you know, it's an intentional, often it, an intentional thing or an intention to wield more authority uh, than is maybe due to a person. But it's sort of so, so, I don't know, it's just so much a part of the Christian rhetoric. You know, people just grow up in these contexts where they hear these certain phrases or these ways of engaging scripture or these ways of talking about God that are just such part of the the wallpaper of the, the language of the place that you just grow up, you just speak the lingo, you just speak in that way. God says that this, 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 Bible says this, our blah, 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 God's reasons above our reason, God says this. And we just kind of, I guess we replicate what we've grown up with or what we've been taught to do. Um, and there might be sort of reasons around this to do with social belonging, um, sense of meaning, sense of contribution, and all those sorts of things that are really important parts of human um, experience um, so I, my intention is never just to sort of have a go for the sake of having a go um, but for me anytime someone uses the phrase God says uh, it's a giveaway that they're adopting a God's eye view approach usually um, unconsciously correlating their own viewpoint with a divine objective viewpoint the way they think about objective viewpoints interpretation and historical and cultural context here become invisible the books that expressly don't adopt this viewpoint, that repudiate it or um, that are very conscious about it and are realistic about their perspectivalism um, without assuming that this makes their writing meaningless just because it's subjective, which is another trap that we can fall into, um, or people who express humility without any self-denigration, these books have a very different feel about them. There's just a different relational tone um, in the way that, uh, that a story is told or that information is, is delivered. Um, and that's just sort of an, my personal intuitive response to them. Now, when it comes to interpretation and the particularities of context, awareness of human mediation, which can't brought to the fore, um, and if it results in the assumption that mediation taints pure truth, which resides out there, um, threatens to atomize us. So if all that there is, is is the way I see things in my own head, then I'm cut off from my world in a little hermetically sealed bubble um, of experience, perception, and meaning making. Um, and this is the debate between those who believe we can have objective knowledge and those who believe that truth is only ever individually subjective or relative. Um, so only absolute objective truth is possible or else there is only relativism, which is sort of a false false opposition or a false uh, choice. Um, obviously, you know, the sense of relativism, everything I see is just my perspective, I taint everything, I can never access pure truth in itself, can feel really abyssal, like... There is no anchorage for my life whatsoever because I'm still thinking about truth as that that absolute objective thing, except that I can't access it, which is a very kind of Kantian uh, derived um, way of seeing things. But um, um, like I've said, though common, the choice between absolute truth and relativism is a false choice. You know, if you look at certain 
Christian books or preachers or whatever get really, really, really anxious about um, we have to we have to stand by what God says or else what is there kind of anchoring our lives? How do we know how to live? There's no, tr- you know, how can we, that's why our world's in a mess because no one's kind of, everyone's kind of ignoring God's truth about how things are. Um, but But these are not the only two choices. The only problem, well, I guess the thing is we need help understanding what the alternatives are. Um, and this is sort of where Hegel comes in. And I've sort of got two more paragraphs, but I'm aware that it's uh, 11.01. So, Milad, would you like me to stop there? Look, uh, how, um, how do you feel about maybe taking those two paragraphs into conversation? Now we can just follow on. Yeah. Um, I mean, we- probably I can sum them up in a sentence or two. How about I do that? So, good. Yeah. So basically, like with Hegel, everything is mediated. Even God, Hegel says God is mediated. God is mediation. Um, because mediation is relationship. And after all, Christians believe in the Trinity. So Hegel even writes the fundamental determination in the concept of God and also in every representation of God is that God is God's self, the mediation of God with God's self. God is true God in that God is the mediation of God's self with God's self, and this is love. So it's still very labyrinthine. It's still very Hegel. Um, But you can see how mediation comes to the fore. So Hegel says we don't need to um, oppose faith and reason as though faith is immediate and reason is always mediated. Everything is always mediated. Um, And what matters about faith is not um, the idea of having faith to begin with, but what we have faith in. That's what we're shaped by. What we believe in is what kind of shapes uh, who we are in our experience. And um, one lovely Hegel quote that I'll finish with is just, he says, our heart ought to have no dread of knowledge. Um, there's nothing to fear in knowledge. Uh, and so it's the movement, the dynamism um, for forward motion that results when things collide and are de- defined by their opposites. That is reason. That's sort of a little bit of Hegel jargon, um, but we're a part of that. So um, yeah, that's it. I, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>